us your spirit now we are close closer than we think creation is groaning longing for the unseen here in this moment eternity's close closer than you think what are they singing what is it like you are surrounded by thunder and light everything in us the longing the ache to join with the heavens the anthem
And if you could turn in your Bibles to Haggai chapter 2, uh, this is a post exilic prophetic uh, passage, two chapters, very short. And this was written around 538 years before Jesus is even born. And I don't have time to really develop the background. I encourage you, if you have the services online, you could go back and watch the first service because I go uh, a little bit, uh, I take time to really give the backdrop. Uh, but anyway, they're rebuilding the temple. Uh, Jeremiah had prophesied after 70 years of being held captive with, by the Babylonians and the Persians took over the Babylonians. They could come back to Israel and they would rebuild the temple that was destroyed in 586 B.C. So what happened was is that they laid the foundation, but the king that gave the blessing, Cyrus, dies. A new king comes and he puts a halt to the building for 18 years. But he dies and Darius becomes king and so he gives permission for people to continue to build the temple. So Haggai's writing in that period where they now need to build the temple. So basically it's a fundraising letter. And so chapter one is basically saying, listen, you know, you're sowing, but you're not reaping. Uh, You live in your own panel houses, but the house is not finished. So let's go up to the mountains, bring down timber and finish the task of building the building. But he says something kind of stunning in chapter two. And I believe he's prophesying to our time. He says in verse seven, I'm going to shake all nations and they will come with the wealth of the nations and I will fill this house with glory. So three things there. There's going to be a global shaking. All the nations will be shaken. In the midst of the shaking, God's going to prosper his people financially. I'll bring the wealth of the nations. And just to make sure you understand, he's talking about money. Verse 8 says, the silver is mine and the gold is mine, says the Lord. How many know the earth is the Lord's? Everything belongs to God. We're just stewards. It's not your money. You have the privilege of stewarding God's money to advance his kingdom. And that's why he's blessing you. And the more you do that, the more he gives to you. And that's the covenant he made with Abram before his name was changed to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, verse 3. He says, I'm going to bless you so all the families of the earth will be blessed through you. And so the whole purpose of prosperity is to fulfill the Great Commission. So we call it prosperity with a purpose. I'm sure you use the same phrase here. And so we have to keep that in mind that God blesses you so you could be a blessing, not just so that you could just hoard it, but to give it away. And here's the main thing. The law of reciprocity is activated. And the more you give, the more he gives back to you. And I'm just going to just share something that was not in my notes. And I'm not talking about giving. Don't get nervous. You already received your tithes and offering. but But my wife and I, love to give. We live to give. And, uh, and you know, for many years, we we're giving 40%, tithes and offering. And the reason why is because Peter Wagner, who's my spiritual father, he passed away in 2016. He was, he and Doris were giving away 40%. But we were provoked by people who are giving 50% and more. Some of the greatest givers in Christian history, like R.G. Letourneau, you may not know who that person is, but how many of you heard of Luterno University or Simpson College? That's right near Bethel uh, building. Uh, he was a marketplace apostle who financed the Christian Missionary Alliance, CMA denomination. He built universities for them, and he gave 90% of everything he had, but the 10% was still millions because God has so prospered him and blessed him. And so, uh, so my wife uh, said her goal is to give away 90%. I said, honey, I'm not there yet. <laughs> uh, God bless you, but I just need to grow a little bit more of my maturity and my faith to get up there. But we're at 65% right now. And the way he has blessed us is just unbelievable. I wrote a book called The Grace of Giving, and I share some of the breakthroughs and testimonies, including getting a $38 million building for $13 million. The most expensive building in Pasadena, a performance arts building, dropped in our lap. And he has allowed me to raise $10 million for the call. Uh, for those who don't know about the call, it's a prayer movement. We did stadium events. I was the president of the call from 2000 to 2003. How many of you heard of Lou Engel? He's a prophet, the visionary founder of it. And yet the Lord gave us all this money for a purpose. And by the way, at the end of the day, when I resigned as president to go back to being a senior pastor and lead our network, we were in the black, 15,000 in the bank, just the right amount that we needed. So when you're talking about 10 million, 15,000 is nothing. So we, the Lord gave us exactly what we needed. 
And now, I, I'm just going to jump ahead. I, I, I'm privileged to uh, oversee apostolically a super PAC. So what's a super PAC? Uh, it's where we can raise money. Uh, you can't get a tax-deductible receipt, but who cares because we want to advance the kingdom of God. And it's unlimited in how much we give away to candidates who are running for office. And each super PAC has to have a, a purpose when you apply to the government, whether it's like Republican women, you know, or uh, let's say uh, ex-military uh, uh, armed forces who want to, uh, you know, raise money for people who are running for office that were the armed forces, retired. And, and so ours is supporting Christian believers with a biblical worldview. So it's a very narrow super PAC, but we're supporting it already. We've raised around 100000 It just opened two weeks ago. We just got permission from the government, and we're already writing out checks to all these candidates who are running for the midterm, and so we're so grateful. And so I'm believing God for millions. Okay, this is not a commercial, but if you want to know more about it, just go to americaupheld.org. One word, americaupheld.org, and you can look at that super PAC. And the reason why I'm so excited about it, because... You know, you have George Soros, who is a Marxist, liberal, left-wing, who has a super PAC, and he's a billionaire. And he's able to finance so many, like, for example, the uh, district attorney uh, of San Francisco was financed by him. But he was such a bad attorney uh, that in 2021, in June, we recalled him, and the people who recalled him were Democrats. And so that's how extreme these people are getting into office by George Soros. And so I was just saying, we need to have a Christian George Soros. We need someone who can give billions to kingdom purposes. Can I hear an amen this morning? And so uh, I'm not the one, so, but I am overseeing the, the business leaders who are uh, raising the money for this super PAC. So I'm very, very excited because we're, we're in a, a new day. And so he says, I'm going to shake the nations, you will, come, you will receive the wealth of the nations. And then the last thing he says is, I'm going to fill this house with glory. And um, he's talking about revival. He's prophesying to our period. Just to make sure you understand what he's talking about, he says, the glory of the latter house is greater than the glory of the former. That's in Haggai 2, verse 9. So in the same context, he's talking about uh, the glory being glorious. And of course... I believe we're in the last days. Now, when we talk about the last days, we're talking about the last 2,000 years. And so with the global shaking comes global glory. And so he says, in the last days, I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh. We're in the last days. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Old men will dream dreams. Young men will see vision. And so we're in this period of the latter part of the last days. And I believe we're going to see greater glory. Because the principle of glory is that you go from glory to glory. You go from faith to faith and from strength to strength. And I believe the most glorious time, and this is what the apostles in the New Testament were longing for, that they would live long enough to see this greater glory come. And yet we're in the generation of this great glory. Now, this is not hype. It's scripture. Because as I shared in the first service, in 2,500 years since Haggai prophesied this, there's only been two global shakings. The first one was World War II, which began in 1939. Every nation was involved in World War II. You had to be aligned either with the Allied forces or the Axis forces, the Axis being Hitler and Italy and Japan, the Allied forces being the United States, Great Britain, and Soviet Union. And if you didn't, you would get invaded by one of the other forces, and they would take your resources. And so for protection, you were aligned. So everyone was involved. But the devastation of that war was that 80 million people died in World War II. What was tragic is that 80% of the 80 million were civilian. We're talking about women and children just being murdered. Of course, the greatest Holocaust took place with 6 million Jews during that period. And um, it just... Uh, you know, just uh, Auschwitz, for example, just one concentration camp in Poland, they killed millions of Jews, burned them. And as you know, you've seen Schindler's List. If you haven't seen it, I recommend that you see it. I also see Saving Private Ryan to show you the trauma our nation went through with World War II and how that impacted families when they lost a a loved one, their son, uh, in World War II. 
And, uh, and, and so they would take them from the train and because they've been on the train for days, they, they, they smelled, they would have a bucket for your feces to be eliminated and uh, no, no mats or beds, it's just straw on the floor of a train that will bring the train right into the death camp of Auschwitz. They would say, okay, we want you to take a shower uh, to get cleaned up from the days of just not taking a shower. And so they would have you strip off your clothes. They would take everything. Now, you have to understand, people brought their goods with them. They brought their cash. They brought their jewelry. Some actually had wore mink coats and brought their, uh, were wearing mink coats as they got off the train. And they took everything, and they thought, okay, we'll get it back after we take the shower. But it was not a shower. They walked into a mass gas chamber, and they killed everyone, men, women, and children. Initially, early days, they would separate the men to work the camps and just kill the women and children and the elderly. But, at, uh, but later on, they just wanted to, Hitler just wanted to kill. He knew his time was short. By 1944, uh, he knew that war was over. It ended in 45, but he just said, okay, just bring them all into the camp. They all went, men and women and children, and they got gas, and they had the, uh, the chimney, uh, the incinerary, where they were burned right after they died, and the smoke would just cause uh, the sun to be blocked out. It was just, and the smell of that, people walked in uh, for the first time, they immediately smell the smoke, and they didn't know what was hitting them. What was this hard smell? It was the smell of people burned to death. And so we're talking about six million died that way in World War II. So it was a, it was a devastating war. You talk about a global shake and nothing like we've ever seen until World War II. And then you talk about the atrocities committed by Stalin and Mao, not just Hitler, because we're talking about any totalitarian regime. The Communist Party globally killed 100 million of their own people. You know, and it's still going on. I mean, you hear about the Uyghur Muslims in China, in concentration camps, they're killing them. They're taking their organs and selling them to the wealthy in China for organ replacement. And they're also making Nike shoes. Nike has a contract with them. I refuse to buy anything Nike because Nike is just saying, hey, we're for BLM and, you know, we've got to fight discrimination. And yet they're paying these Uyghur Muslims, not paying them, but getting free work, slave labor, and these people are being killed. The human rights record of China and North Korea and all these other places are just absolutely atrocious. But let me tell you another policy that they have that is very same with our policy. They believe in abortion to the last day of the ninth month. Only a few nations have that policy. We're talking about communist China. We're talking about North Korea and the United States. Our policy of abortion to the last day of the ninth month is absolutely an abomination to God. And that's scripture. Because the, the Lord says in Proverbs 6, 16, there's six things the Lord hates, seven, which is an abomination. Hands that shed in some blood is right there in the middle of that list of uh, abominations, including pride, including a lying tongue. That puts the fear of the Lord in me. So when I share, I try to be as accurate as possible. I want no hyperbole, even no exaggeration. I want to share the truth and love because we're to speak the truth and love, and that's how we grow into maturity in Christ Jesus. So I'm not here to bash anyone because of abortion. If you had an abortion, there's freedom in Christ. I'm going to be transparent. I got my girlfriend pregnant at the age of 16, and I encouraged her to get the abortion. I'm as culpable as anyone. Now, I was not saved. I got saved at the age of 17. So we're, we're all uh, culpable in the sense that we're sinners, but for the grace of God. Amen. Thank God for the grace of God. And I just love his forgiveness and his mercy. So there's now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. But we have to fight this as the number one injustice issue of our time. There's nothing worse than hands that shed innocent blood. And we're talking about an innocent baby. And so anyway, uh, I, I have to say that wherever I go. So I just want to just share my heart because I, I know that part of the uh, reformation that we're going to see is that we're going to see California, and I'm prophesying this, and I'm actually quoting Lou Engel because in 1984, when we moved to California, he prophesied two things. 
He said Roe v. Wade will be overturned and that California, number two, will be a pro-life state. Can I hear an amen? It's going to be a pro-life state. I don't know how. It could be generations from now. It took us 49 years of contending for Roe v. Wade, but it's overturned. And so it could be your children's generation. So we have to think in terms of legacy. We have to think in terms of our children's generation and our grandchildren's generation. Proverbs 13, 22 says, a good man or woman leaves an inheritance for his grandchildren, not just his children, but grandchildren. And by the way, and the wealth of the unrighteous is stored up for the righteous. Unrighteous being, again, unbelievers. Uh, and that's another verse for the transfer of wealth uh, that we read about in Haggai chapter 2. So World War II was a global shaking. But God promises, he said, I'm going to shake all nations and I'm going to fill this house with glory. So what happened after World War II? We come into a historic period of 50 years of glory, unprecedented glory. It began really right after World War II, 45, but the peak of it started in 48. Massive revival broke out globally. You have the Voice of Healing revival in America. How many of you heard of Oral Roberts? Okay, or Branham, A.A. A. Allen, Jack Cole. They were part of the Voice of Healing that started with Gordon Lindsay uh, being the apostle to help these people to be more effective in reaching the masses. That happened in 1948. And, uh, and so we see the signs and wonders of T.L. Osborne being launched and really continued uh, on to uh, Catherine Coleman and, uh, and even Benny Hinn. Then you have, you have, in 48, the Hebrides revival in Scotland. Off of Scotland, there's a set of islands called the Hebrides Islands, and the glory came upon that, and including... Uh, this one island called Lewis Island that Duncan Campbell, who was an evangelist, recorded in his observation, everyone on that island got saved. Everyone. He didn't know one person was not a believer. And so how do you accommodate when a whole island gets saved? What would happen if all of Turlock got saved? Where would you meet? How many services would you have? So here's what it looks like in Lewis Island. Every single church building was filled to capacity four times every single day. And you could only go to one service a week. That's the point. So your service may be 9.30 at 9 on Tuesday night. But that's the service you went to because you couldn't get into any other services. What does revival really look like? So in my book, I share three characteristics of a revival that I shared yesterday with the leaders. So very simply, the church gets revived first. It always begins with the house of the Lord. It's 1 Peter 4, 17, judgment begins in the house of the Lord. Number two, the harvest comes in. And third, society is transformed. And so we see the harvest coming in in 48. We have the latter rain revival in uh, Saskatchewan, North Batterford, specifically in Canada. And a lot of things that we do today, like I love, can we give a hand for our worship team? They did a tremendous job. I, I just love, what an amazing worship team. But we sang in the spirit. You know when that began? It didn't begin with the Azusa Street revival. In fact, they sang hymns, just like any other mainline denominational churches. But it began in 1948, Latter Rain. The whole prophetic presbytery got started in 48, where you would prophesy, have a number of prophets prophesy over people. Uh, the idea that prophets and apostles are for today began in 1948. It was a powerful revival, and we've been so impacted by the latter rain, especially people like Dick Iverson and, uh, and that stream of uh, MFI that came out of the latter rain, and including the Kiteleys. Violet Kiteley went home to be with, David Kiteley went home to be with the Lord, but that, that stream right here in California, the reason why I'm bringing it there in Oakland, so they're close by. And so we've been impacted by the latter rain. And then you have Billy Graham. You have the evangelical revival that broke out in 48. 49, Billy Graham does his crusade in L.A. and launches him to international fame. Campus Crusade started in 1950. So around the same time, the evangelicals, so we see that revival breaking out right after World War II. Ten years after that, the charismatic movement begins in 1958. Begins with an Episcopalian priest named Dennis Bennett in Van Nuys, California, he gets baptized in the Holy Spirit, just sovereignly. And not only him, but a number of his leaders get baptized in the Holy Spirit. 
And all of a sudden, they're now a charismatic. They believe in the Pentecostal experience of the second blessing. He starts speaking in tongues. And so it was really controversial because he's Anglican. He's Episcopalian. And so he writes a book called Nine O'Clock in the Morning and becomes a bestseller. And it's in reference to Acts chapter 2 when Peter gets up in verse 17. These men are not drunk as you think. It's only 9 o'clock in the morning. But this is that what was spoken of, the prophet Joel. In the last days, I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and daughters will prophesy. The charismatic movement, what would distinguish that from the Assembly of God or Church of God in Christ that came out of Azusa Street in 1906, they stayed in their denomination. So you have Lutheran charismatics, Southern Baptist charismatics, you have Mennonite charismatics, you have the Catholic charismatic movement. Ten years after that is the Jesus People Movement, started in 1967, in, again, in Costa Mesa, California, with Chuck Smith, Lonnie Frisbee. You may not have heard of these people, but you need to get to know them because they moved extraordinary. Lonnie Frisbee was the, just this incredible moving and signs and wonders, supernatural and then 10 years after that, you have the third wave with John Wimber. Now, you may not think he had a tremendous impact, but he had a global impact. He went to England. One third of the Anglican priests got baptized in the Holy Spirit through him, including a church named Holy Trinity Brompton with Sandy Miller and Nick Gumbel. How many of you heard of the Alpha Course? Any of you heard of the Alpha Course? Well, that was birthed out of that revival. And that course teaches people how to be baptized in the Holy Spirit, coming from an Anglican church out of England. That's the impact that John Wimber had. And the reason why I know that is because John Wimber was my pastor. I was a vineyard pastor. Before Harvest Rock Church, uh, the first year, 94, we were a Harvest Rock vineyard of Pasadena. But then, at that same time, the Holy Spirit fell in Toronto, 1994. How many of you ever experienced a Toronto blessing in 94, went up to Toronto? Now, just a few hands is amazing. Because some of you were just little kids at that time in 94. But what about Brownsville revival, 95? And uh, it was a powerful revival. We're talking about over 2 million people flew into Toronto uh, in the early days of that revival. Our church was birthed out of that revival. John Arnott came to our church in January uh, 3rd of uh, 1995. 2,000 people showed up in Pasadena. Never in the history of our city have we had a large, that large of a charismatic gathering of any kind, Pentecostal or charismatic. And that was the beginning of our nightly meetings. We had nightly meetings uh, from 1995 to 1998, uh, five nights a week. But after that, 10 years later, and by the way, Bill Johnson, uh, Benny Johnson, <laughs> they were just sharing about how she got blasted in Toronto she went, walked in, and they had to carry her out. She was so drunk uh, when she went there in 95. So we see a lot of the uh, people who are part of, quote, the Revival Alliance, Randy Clark, uh, John and Carol Arnott, of course, the, the, uh, the founders of the uh, church in Toronto, Heidi Baker. She went there to criticize. She didn't believe this was of the Lord. And then she's on the floor for seven days. She can't even get up. The only way she got up was when they carried her to the restroom to go to the bathroom. But the Lord told her, I want you on the floor. And uh, she was so undone by the Holy Spirit. But when she got up, their ministry was not that big. They had a few orphans. But she goes back to Mozambique and revival breaks out. And so there's a huge move of the Holy Spirit. But after that, 10 years later, we thought another wave would hit. It didn't happen. 2008. 2010, 20, 20, just the opposite happens. We go into a lockdown. We go into a pandemic. COVID-19 hits in January, not revival. And now what I want to say is that the second global shaking begins in 2020. Every nation has been impacted by COVID. 200 nations. We're not just talking about the virus, which is deadly, but we're not talking about the same death rate as World War II. We're talking about 80 million in World War II. We're talking about between five and six million, and of course, globally, but those numbers are inflated because I know one of our pastors died of COVID, but he has been fighting cancer for three years, but they listed as COVID when he finally passed away. So we don't know the accurate count, even in America. Are you following what I'm saying? 
But nevertheless, it's a real pandemic. The economic shutdown, California, 18,000 businesses went bankrupt just in California alone. So the economic ramification, and we've gone into this perfect storm because it's not only the uh, pandemic and the lockdown and the egregious mask mandate where kids, the way kids learn is through facial expression, not just a vocal teaching, but to have kids wear masks and the teachers to wear masks. First of all, shutting down the schools, per, I mean, they're two years behind right now. When they finally opened up, it was just, just devastating on their education growth. But to have to wear masks when they did gather together was just so egregious. And again, it was just like the spirit of stupid came upon this nation. You know, it's like, what are we doing? And, and so, you know, again, it, it, you know, I, I'm just being honest with you because my dad was a prisoner in communist North Korea for being a pastor. I could smell communism away, a mile away. And I just saw neo-Marxism coming into California when they locked down the church. No one's above the Constitution. The governor had to swear on the Bible to uphold and defend the Constitution. And when he locked down the church, he violated the First Amendment of the Constitution. And when you see them becoming a law unto themselves, someone has to stand up and sue and say, this is wrong, time out. So it was really a no-brainer. I mean, I had to get a word from God to do that. You just don't sue the governor without getting a rhema. But I got that rhema, and I said, okay, we're in it. I got a letter the next month. They were going to arrest me, put me in jail for one year. It was very, very specific. They were going to fine me $1,000, all the church members, $1,000 per person for each week that we've been meeting. We're talking about millions of dollars in fine. And we told our church, we will do whatever to pay for that. We're, we have reserve, but even if we have to sell our beautiful building, we're going to pay for it because we're not going to, we're not going to capitulate. We're not going to give in to this. And the last statement they wrote from the city prosecutor, this letter to me, was that we reserve the right to arrest your church members. And I'm saying, I am not in North Korea. I'm in the United States of America. I mean, we're talking about law-abiding citizens who pay their taxes. I'm talking about you and me. We just simply want to worship Jesus, and they want to arrest us. Especially the crazy irony is that Newsom was allowing criminals out of prison because he wanted social distancing and, and space in prisons. So he's letting criminals out, but he wants to arrest people who love Jesus, who want to simply worship Jesus. And so we have come to the place where Isaiah 5, verse 20, prophesies to our period. Woe to those who call evil good, good, evil, darkness, light, light, darkness. So letting the prisoners out so you could have some social distancing, that's good. We're going to save lives in prison. But to arrest Christians who want to worship in the midst of a lockdown, you know, I mean, you know, the, the, this, this is it's crazy. It's not good. It's evil. And so the fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Proverbs 8, 13. And then he lives, pride, arrogance, and a perverted mouth I hate. And we've got nothing but perversion coming out of the media and from this administration, from leaders that are just lying to us. It's the Marxist playbook. And Lenin taught, I'm, I'm telling you the truth, so Lenin taught in order to perpetuate our revolution, even if we have to lie, we have to do it. So Russia created a newspaper, a daily newspaper called The Truth, Pravda. But it was nothing but propaganda. It was just lies, just to control people. And if you descended, there was not one person who could descend, you would be sent to prison. You would be sent to the gulag. All you have to do is read Solzhenitsyn's book, Gulag Archipelago, to see how evil people became under communism. People turning in their family members. You know, and Alexander Solzhenitsyn, all he did, he was a lieutenant in the Communist Party military. He just made fun of, of uh, Stalin's beard, and he got sent to prison. Any kind of dissent is that cancel culture. And so we're seeing this in our society, and so we have to really uh, be discerning and discern the times we're living in, know what we're to do. I shared in the first service, the one phrase that Jesus uses more than any other phrase, more than love one another, more than repent, 
He says, he who has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit's saying to the church. 16 times in the New Testament he says that. Seven times in Revelation 2 and 3 alone. But nevertheless, he says this over and over again. So we have to be prophetic. We have to hear what the Spirit of God is saying. We have to wake up and discern the times we're living in. Because Paul talks about this in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. He said, in the last days, it will be mad times. That word, terrible times, the Greek word is the same word to describe the Gadaronia demoniac. Insanity. Insane time. How many of you feel it's been insane what's been going on in society? If you just, you can't even watch the news. It's just your barrage with such negativity. Every day something bad happens. But God, why is God allowing this global shaking? C.S. Lewis said it this way because he lived through World War II. And he wrote this uh, right uh, after World War II. And by the way, C.S. Lewis came out of 48. Uh, that revival. And, and he became a Christian and, and uh, started to write Chronicles of Narnia and Mere Christianity. It was just a, brilliant because he was an Oxford professor of literature. He said this. He said, God whispers to us in our pleasure. In other words, God's speaking to us all the time when things are going well. One of my favorite verses, Isaiah 30, verse 21. He's going to whisper behind your ears. This is the way walk ye in it, whether to the right or to the left. And the reason why he's whispering is because he wants intimacy with you. He wants you to draw near to him. It's James 4, 8, draw near to God, he'll draw near to you. So C.S. Lewis says he whispers in our pleasure when things are going well, but he shouts to us in our pain. What's he saying? When things are going well, a lot of times even people who are, you know, nominal in their faith, they don't call out to God. They don't pray to God. They may believe in him, but they don't really walk with him. But the moment you're going through problems, when you're going through pain, when you're suffering, when you're going through a global shake, and you start crying out to God, even if you're agnostic, you're saying, God, I don't even know if you're up there, but if you're there, help. I need your help. I need a financial breakthrough. Are you hearing what I'm saying? And so the globe is being ripe for the harvest because whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And that's the beginning of your spiritual search for truth. And whoever seeks, they're going to find. If they're really sincere about searching for the truth, they're going to find Jesus. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through him. Can I hear an amen? Am I preaching to the right group here? And so God's allowing this shaking to go on to bring about a global harvest. And so we saw a massive 50 years of revival. But if we go from glory to glory in the glory of the latter house, so the the next shaking is COVID. What's the next 50 years going to look like? I want to submit to you, we're on the verge of the greatest revival in the history of the church, the greatest revival. But again, I want to remind you what revival looks like is the church beginning revived first, returning to her first love. The harvest coming in. You said, Where, where's the harvest? I don't know if you heard of Let Us Worship. And let me also encourage you to watch Super Spreader. It's a documentary that just came out like last week. Super Spreader. Because they called Sean Foyt a super spreader for having Let Us Worship and gathering all these people, thousands of people during the midst of covid I mean, the context of it is not that they're gathering now. They were doing it back in, uh, back in uh, June of 2020. They had 7,000 people right in Huntington Beach. Right when the, the beach closed down. In California, as you know, they closed down the beach. You couldn't even gather in the beach. They arrested someone just surfing by himself on the beach. I mean, there's no one around him. He's just by himself. But they arrested him because he violated the beach law. I mean, who's he going to give COVID to or who's going to get COVID from? He's just by himself. And so it made no rational sense that they would rather, he didn't think he was going to get arrested, but he got arrested. So they gathered 7,000 people and they were blown away by so many people who showed up because it just was social media. Just say, hey, we're going to worship here on Huntington Beach. 7,000 people show up. My spiritual son, Jay Koopman, goes down from Pasadena, preaches to that group because he's good friends with Sean. And Sean knows Jason an evangelist. He's not. He's a worship leader. He can draw people through worship, but he needed someone to pull in the net. And literally hundreds of people gave their hearts to the Lord. They baptized them in the Pacific Ocean. It was like the Jesus people movement all over again. Since then, they've gone to literally over 100 cities and done these letters worship. You just Google them, just YouTube them, and you'll see... 
thousands of young people have come to know the Lord. Six months ago, I asked Jay, I said, Jay, just conservative, don't, don't exaggerate. I just want to know, in your conservative estimation, how many young people have given their hearts to Jesus Christ? He said, Papa Jay, at least 50,000, at least. That was six months ago. We're talking about 100,000 plus young people getting saved. And it's just the beginning. Come on, the harvest is coming in. But here's the part that I want to close with. I believe we're in a time of social transformation, unprecedented social transformation. Winning the lawsuit was a sign of social transformation. Thank God that the Supreme Court, now this is where I want to just really emphasize, elections, you heard of this phrase, have consequences. Elections do matter. If all we did was have President Trump be president for four years, whether he runs or not, I have no idea. I'm not a prophet but that he nominated three Supreme Court judges that got confirmed, Gorsuch, Kavanaugh, and Amy Coney Barrett. If that's all was accomplished, the motion is now set for unprecedented victory by the Supreme Court on the side of biblical values. First of all, they sided with us that we can open up the church, 6-3. And not only the church, but even Bible studies, because Newsom had locked down Bible studies and prayer meetings in homes. And now we can meet. And by the way, it's not just California. It's set a precedence for the whole United States. In perpetuity, no governor or president can lock down the church ever again. Can we give Jesus a praise of glory? But it's more than that. I mean, it's the federal judge in Florida that said wearing a mask on public transportation is unconstitutional. CDC cannot make that decision. It has to be the Congress that makes that decision. And all of a sudden, we can fly without our masks. And for those who travel, I know you're saying, thank you, Jesus, because that's me. I thank God for that. And it wasn't just that. It was Coach Joe Kennedy who kneeled on the 50-yard line after a football game. He got not arrested, but he got terminated. He lost his job for just praying by himself quietly on the 50-yard line. And they said a separation of church and state, and he sued and went all the way to the Supreme Court and said it was religious discrimination. He has every right to pray in schools. It opened the door for prayer to go back into schools. Come on. And then we're talking about uh, Maine. In Maine, the state of Maine, we're talking about parents who, because it's so rural, there's not enough public schools. They're miles away. So Maine made the decision that you can enroll your child in a private school and will pay for that online school, high school, but it can't be Christian. And so the parents who are Christian said, most of our schools that we know are private online are Christian. And so they sued the state of Maine. It went all the way to the Supreme Court again this past June. And the Supreme Court sided with the parents, and now the state has to pay for these school education. <laughs> Open the door for school choice and for a voucher program even in our state. It's unprecedented what's been going on. One battle, I was talking to Matt Staver, our attorney, he said, I've never seen anything like it. It's just like it's dizzying. All the courts, I mean, you couldn't even fly the Christian flag in Boston City. Again, separation church, it went all the way to the Supreme Court. They would fly the gay pride flag. They would fly any flag from the other nation, but not Christian. And the Supreme Court cited 9-0, even the liberals said, something has shifted in America. And so just through legislation, why is that a big deal? Because it was through legislation that slavery ended in the Great Britain. The slave trade ended in 1807 called the Slave Trade Act. It was through Parliament was through a man named William Wilberforce who kept on passing a bill and, and then realizing that it was just getting defeated at all the time. They said, we have to elect abolitionists into the House of Commons. And then they had enough abolitionists by 1807 that slave trade ended. And then by 1833, every slave was released in all the British Commonwealth nation. If you had a slave in Canada or Australia or New Zealand, they were all released. South Africa, they were all released without having to go through a civil war. And so I began to realize, Lord, we are in a time of transformation, but it's going to be through legislation. We're seeing the battle. So that's why I'm here to encourage you. Please, your vote matters. Register and vote. And vote biblically. 
vote biblical values, vote life. And I believe as we do that, now I'm going to ask, you know, others to do more, like give to America a pelt, you know, uh, be a poll watcher. There's so many things you could do. And by all means, run for office. I'm so blown away by your church. I'm provoked in a good way. Because at the leaders meeting, you know, I saw Mayor Pam, wherever she is, and, and other m- members of city council and, and uh, one of the school board members. And I just said, you have more people in government. Now, good news, things are shifting in our network. Uh, we have one of our church members that won city council uh, seat in La Crescenta, where our, our church is located, near, right next to Pasadena. So we're starting to move in that direction, but you're way ahead of us. And so I really want to encourage you to volunteer freely on the day of his power. I believe we're living the most exciting time, but it's time for us to roll up our sleeves, and that's just going to happen just, you know, uh, just sovereignly. It's just going to happen. No. The way the harvest came in is because revival hit in 1904 at Mariah Chapel, a small little building. I've been to Wales. I've been to that building. We're talking about one half of this section here. That's how small the building is. But 100,000 people got saved in the first six months. You know why? Because a youth group hit the streets. They hit the bars, the pubs. They went into the bars boldly and started to share the gospel. They got kicked down and they waited for the patrons to come out and then they shared with them. They went to prisons. They went to the police station, shared with the police officer and the criminals behind cells. They all started to get saved. But eventually, police were out of work. There was no one to arrest because everyone was saved in Wales. So that's when they started the, uh, the quartets, police quartets. You know, they started singing the church services because, you know, they, they have a redemptive gift of music in Wales. They, they're great preachers, great singers. It, the mules that were carrying the coal mines from uh, the, uh, uh, the coal from the coal mines, they were absolutely confused. They didn't know which way to turn, to the right or left, because before they were, they were given direction with curse words. Now the miners were just speaking nicely to the animals and they were absolutely, they didn't know where to go. They said that Christmas was the happiest Christmas. This is 1904, December. Before, the miners would take their Christmas bonus and buy alcohol and get drunk on Christmas Day. For the first time, they bought gifts for their children and went to services on Christmas Day. And they came back and they opened it. You could walk down the streets of Wales and you heard laughter. Kids were laughing because the dads were home and they were opening gifts for the first time. We're talking about social transformation from revival. I believe that God wants to do that here in California. Let's all stand up together. As I was, I was praying this morning and I just said, Lord, what, what are you saying? How do you want me to close? And I heard the Lord say, consecrate yourself today or tomorrow I'm going to do amazing things. That's from Joshua 3, 5. Consecrate yourself and tomorrow he's going to do wonders. I believe the best is yet ahead. I believe we're in a Proverbs 4, 18 period. The path of the righteous is like the light of dawn shines brighter and brighter until the full day. And I believe that we're going to see both darkness and shaking continue. So don't get me wrong. But parallel with that, we're going to see the greatest revival, the greatest move of the Holy Spirit, signs and wonders, the supernatural. In fact, we're having a healing service tonight. We want to pray for the sick, invite your friends to come. And we're going to see a tremendous um, uh, uh, encounter. We're going to have tremendous encounters until Jesus Christ comes back. We're in that period. But let's consecrate ourselves. Dale Moody, the great American evangelist, was told he was visiting England and someone came up to him and said, uh, The world is yet to see what God would do through a person who's totally consecrated to him. And he said, I'll be that person. And God used him to lead two million people to the Lord after that because he got baptized in the Holy Spirit soon after that. It's amazing. I I was thinking about 2 Chronicles 16, 9. The eyes of the Lord look throughout the whole earth that he may show himself strong on behalf of those whose hearts are completely his. So I want you to make that kind of commitment by the grace of God. You can't do it even apart from the grace of God. But if you're sincere, he'll look at your heart. And the Bible says he wants to show himself strong on behalf of those hearts are completely his. Would you pray this prayer with me? Pray it out loud, those who are watching online, those in different campuses. Pray this out loud. I want you to articulate this. Make this your decree. 
And if you haven't given your life to Jesus Christ, and you're a guest here, this is a great prayer to pray to give your heart to Jesus Christ. Would you repeat after me? Let's just say this together. Just say, Heavenly Father, forgive me for all my sins. I repent. Jesus, I give you my whole life. All that I am, all that I have, I consecrate myself. And by your grace, I will love you with all my heart. I will trust you. I will obey you. I will follow you all the days of my life. Fill me with the Holy Spirit. Give me more of your spirit. In Jesus' mighty name. Now, I know I heard your voices, so I believe most of you have prayed, but I want you to raise your hand if you prayed that prayer, all of us. Just raise your hand just say, yes, I prayed that prayer. But I'm going to put your hand down. I'm going to ask, have you really prayed that for the first time or as a rededication because you've been away from God? Or maybe you've been coming for a while, but you really never prayed that as sincerely as you did today. I want to count to three, and I'm going to ask you to raise your hand again and just hold it up because I want you to exercise faith. Faith without action is dead. James chapter 2, verse 17. And so what he wants you to do is just to be a lightning rod for the grace of God, to say, yes, Lord, I meant that, and I'm going to boldly declare it here in a very safe place with brothers and sisters around. I want you to raise your hand. I want to count to three. Just hold it up high because I want to pray for you as well. One, two, three. Go ahead and hold your hand up high. Yes. Hands are going up. I see four hands up here, another hand up here in the balcony. Just raise your hand high and just say yes. I see several hands up there in the balcony. Father, I pray that you would seal this commitment by the grace of God. And those who are in the other campuses that people are raising hands, I pray that you will so fill them with the love of Jesus Christ. The love of God has been shed abroad in our hearts through the Holy Spirit. To love you with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. And to love our neighbor as ourselves. I ask you to seal this in Yeshua HaMashiach's name. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. Pastor Ron, thank you so much.